You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you're here as in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and not uh, as simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many more doors. See, the show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Hello. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. Well, we are going to continue what we're doing, but we do have some news and notesies to get to. And then uh, I think we'll do running back. Again, not a ton to cover. Uh, we don't really need to dig into Aaron Jones's college days, although it might be interesting just out of curiosity how he did in college. I don't even know. I know I liked him, but anyways, uh, it shouldn't take a ton of time. So anyways, uh, let's start with this. The dates have been released for the Green Bay Packers uh, training camp schedule. And when I say the dates have been released, I mean, we don't know much, but we got the days down, generally speaking, the times we have no idea, but I guess who really cares i mean we generally know it's going to be like 11 o'clock probably or something like that i think sometimes they do late like especially before family night because they want to get into the rhythm of it but anyways uh july 26th will be their first practice i think we talked about that um they usually do about two days and then get a day off or whatever so it's going to be wednesday thursday then saturday then monday then tuesday thursday and then saturday august 5th is packers family night um it's always kind of a bittersweet thing. Pa- Packers family night is a lot of fun. I like staying up and watching it and everything else. But boy, I do miss the old days of uh, them actually doing 11 on 11 stuff. But that's all right. We'll get to see everybody out there and running around and it'll be cool. Then we got August, Monday the 7th. And then it looks like it's going to be about a week off. And then the next practice will be Monday, August 14th. Then we get into the joint practices. That Wednesday, August 16th, joint pa- practice with the Patriots. Wednesday, August 16th. Is that right? Wednesday, August 17th, joint practice with the Patriots. And then August 22nd, that Tuesday. And then Wednesday, the 23rd, is last practice open to the public. I'm a little confused on one thing. Oh, okay. That's I think that's where that gap is. That, that one week is when they're traveling to Cincinnati for the Bengals. I knew they were going out to Cincinnati to have joint practices with the Bengals. I just didn't see it on there, but I guess this is just um, uh, a schedule for people that want to see them at camp or whatever. So anything that's away doesn't count. So very cool. They got joint press. So it's going to be August 7th. And then they'll have joint practices, I'm guessing probably two, just like with the Patriots, prior to the August 11th game. So like 8th and 9th maybe, and then take a day off and then come back August 11th or something like that. Um, Anyway, some other interesting notes. July 21st, the Packers 1K Kids Run, kids 10 years old and younger, presented by Polaris. Friday, July 21st, same day, quarterbacks, rookies, and injured players report. Next day, Packers 5K Run Walk, presented by Bell & Health. Then we got the shareholders meeting at 11 a.m. July 24th. And uh, we already talked about family night, et cetera, et cetera. But it goes on to add, and this is pretty cool. It says, um, according to Discover Green Bay and a 2010 study, training camp, along with Packers Family Night, presented by Bell & Health, could attract approximately 80,000 vid- visitors from across the nation and as many t- as 20 foreign countries with a total economic impact estimated at approximately $9 million. 
that's such a cool thing the Packers are for for the state and for the you know local community and everything. Nine million dollars. I can't imagine some of the smaller towns around here in Wisconsin or anywhere in the country just randomly over the course of a couple of weeks or a month or whatever getting nine million dollars just from that one thing just pumped into the economy. Just randomly have eighty thousand people pour into your city. And just be like, what up? Can I eat all your food and partake in what you do here? It's super cool. See what else we got here. Uh, report. Aaron Rodgers refused a trade to the Patriots this offseason, according to Fox Sports. The report says the Patriots made an offer to the Packers for Aaron Rodgers, but his agent rejected it. But as always, I like to go back to the source and find out what exactly we're talking about, right? This A lot of times we see these reports and it's like, report, uh, this happened. And we're like, dude, this is just like news. Like, this is a thing that happened. Well, no, they're reporting based on what somebody said. So let's find out who said it and what exactly they said. Here is a snippet of that segment. That Aaron Rodgers almost wasn't a Jet. What? The New England Patriots made an offer to the Green Bay Packers to get Aaron Rodgers. And when Aaron Rodgers heard it, his agent said, no. Never. We ain't playing for New Never. England. Wow. We want to be a Jet, JJ. Uh, uh, Talk about it. Ooh, I mean, I like it. I mean, I don't want to go to New England either. You know, <laughs> so I kind of agree with Aaron, you know what I mean? New York a little bit better than New England. So, you know, I agree. You know, and then you don't want to be the, the type of caliber of player that Aaron Rodgers is. You- isn't, it, isn't New York in New England? Isn't that just that whole region? I mean, it's not just, New England doesn't mean Boston, even though in an NFL sense it does, but I'm pretty sure, well, it doesn't matter. You no, know, it was a guy there before him that did a lot of good yes, stuff. Yes, so you, you don't, don't want to follow those footsteps. Follow What's a lot of reasons? Yeah. You want to follow those footsteps? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the word is that it ain't fun playing in New England for yeah, Bill exactly. Belichick, although you do win. Yeah. Uh, and number three, the New York Jets just have better talent right now in the moment <laughs> than New England does, but... Those snakes in the grass in New England can never be trusted. And I want to thank my main man right here, Aaron Rodgers, for recognizing you don't go play for Satan. You don't go, you play, don't go Satan. play for Satan. But could you imagine Satan? if Aaron Rodgers actually chose man. to go to the New England Patriots, man. what we'd be talking about right now? Man, I mean, it's scary to even think of Bill Belichick and Aaron Rodgers. Yes. Uh, together, those two football minds. I mean, we've seen what he yeah, did sure. with Tom Brady. You know, to have, I mean, I don't know what number he would have wore. Over yeah, there, probably not AR, 12. AR8. <laughs> AR8 again yeah. over there. But, uh, no, that would have been scary, though. Yeah, the entire uh, apple cart would have been upset yeah. in the yeah. AFC. Yeah. And, of course, Tom Brady would be uh, the Jets quarterback. It would be a crazy <laughs> scenario. But I learned that yesterday when I met my source in the parking lot of a local high school. And he told me. <laughs> wow. Anyways. Listen, listen, here's the deal. That deal almost, well, it didn't almost happen, but New England made a run at it, which also shows you New England's dissatisfaction with Mac Jones. That's a real thing. That is very true, and that is a real thing. Even when you hear them talk about uh, quarterback competition with him and Bailey Zappi, and he's out playing Bailey Zappi or whatever it may be, that lets you know that they are not all the way bought in to Mac and G's. So I, I don't know that there's too much to read into that. There's some speculation as to uh, potential reasons and whatnot, but I think they're from usually pretty garbage accounts. It's not impossible that there's some juicy information in here somewhere, but as of right now, there really isn't. But um, it's something to kind of keep our ear to the ground on, see if anything else comes out on this. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not going to get into the speculation of what people are talking about, because again, it's probably mostly garbage. Um, we'll get into some of the locker room stuff, some of the interviews or whatever at a later time, maybe if we can. Apparently at some point, Jordan Love had made a comment. This is uh, via Zach Jacobson on Twitter. The only reason I'm reading it is because apparently, even according to him in his own comments, this has created quite a stir. Let me read Jordan Love's comment. Quote, I don't think we have that one player right now that's like, oh, this is who we have to throw the ball to on third down and things like that. The defense really might not know who to focus on on third down. Zach went on to elaborate and say interpretations of this are all over the place. Some people think it's a shot at Aaron Rodgers. Some people think it means Jordan Love doesn't think the Packers have any receivers. Some people think it means there's more variety for the defense to account for. I can make this real easy for everybody because if you read it, Jordan Love explained the point 
that he was getting at. There's two parts to the quote. We don't have that one guy that stands out that you have to throw to. What's the second part? Defenses really might not know who to focus on on third down. He's highlighting one of the positives of their offense. And the only thing he's saying is that there's, there's equal footing among the, the receivers. It's not like in the past when you had, you know, the number one wide receiver in football and then like a low-end number two wide receiver. So, I mean, good Lord, if anybody's reading. The, I mean, let's just be smart about this. Do you think Jordan Love went to a, a microphone and said, yeah, we just don't really have any guys right now? And how in the world could this possibly be a dig at Aaron Rodgers? He's commenting on the wide receivers. I don't think we have that one player right now that's like, oh, this is the guy we have to throw to. That can't be a dig at Aaron Rodgers, because it also implies that if you did have a guy like Devontae, that you would throw to him. The reason that defenses are confused is because the ball is going to be spread out, and the reason is that there isn't massive talent gaps between the top guy and the bottom guys. So it's not in any way a dig at Aaron Rodgers. He never commented on the quality of the players, only that they're equal. And at the final part of the comment, he gave us the reason why he said it. The benefit of it. So what the heck are we talking about? So funny reading the comments and they're like, well, I think, I think. Then they just blurt out their feelings. Nobody cares your interpretation. This isn't, you know, a a painting where you stare at it and go, it's like, ah, and you just make up some garbage because you're, you know, you're scribbling circles on a piece of, this isn't art, okay? This isn't up for interpretation. There is a right answer and a wrong answer, and this one's spelled out for you. This, this is what annoys me, you know, and we get the national media people doing it, but we even have fans doing this stuff, where we love to take quotes and then turn it into whatever it is fits our own narrative. Dude, he said something and he meant one thing. You don't get to just take it and make it your own thing. I think Jordan Love said that he has bad wide receivers. Are you freaking stupid? Seriously. You think that's what he just said? Why would he do that? Freudian slip? Anyways, let's get to some positive news about the Chicago Bears before we pivot to our running back discussion. Report, the Chicago Bears are unhappy with the wide receiver Chase Claypool this offseason on and off the field per, let's see if I can get this guy's official name, not just his Twitter handle, Tom Waddle, uh, former Chicago Bear and current host of Waddle and Sylvie on ESPN 1000, Chicago's home for sports, on that show. According to Silverman, his mentality isn't where the Bears would like it to be especially considering he's nursing minor injuries that cost him part of camp. So he's he's injured, so he can't practice, so they need a little bit more from him, and he's not putting it in. Quote, I have heard from a few people inside that building that he is not somebody who's very self-motivated, Silverman said. There's a long way to go. Chase Claypool can change the narrative. Last trade deadline, Chicago sent a second-round pick to Pittsburgh for Claypool. Pick 32, which in my opinion is a, third, a first-round pick which was essentially a first-rounder for a wide receiver who struggled during the 10 games he played for the Bears last season. By the way, pick 32 wouldn't have been that bad of a pick for them to have. Joey Porter, the corner, was sitting right there. That's who went 32. They could use another corner. How about Sam Laporta? That went to the Lions at 34. I know they have Komet, but they don't have a guy like Port Laporta. They do have Michael Mayer, which you'd have two Cole Komets. That might be a little silly, but why not? Steve Avila, offensive line. Matthew Bergeron, same. Jonathan Mingo, another wide receiver. I mean, these are the things, by the way, Chase Claypool scares nobody. And and I'll be honest, you know, the, the first round pick, yeah, they got that tackle. That That's it's a good pick. They need a tackle. They got it. We'll see if he pans out, whatever. But if you stack on top of that, for example, if you have Mingo and DJ Moore and you've built up your offensive line, you know what I mean? Like that one little extra thing makes a difference. Claypool's a freaking bum. I mean, this has the potential to be good. If, if Claypool was the guy that he was coming out of college. And and Darnell Mooney looked like how he was in year two. And DJ Moore stays where he is. That's a great group. But two of those three guys don't care anymore. Or just aren't doing what they're supposed to do. And Cole Komet has never really become the guy that I think they really wanted him to be. You add in somebody that can really help. And suddenly, you know, again, your defense is still a little rough. But there's Mr. Isaiah Fosky. B.J. Ojolar, you could have got Luke Musgrave, who, I'll be honest, looks pretty good. Joe Tipman, the center. Brian Branch, I, I don't know, they don't really need a safety. Keon White, Cody Mock, Keanu Benton, uh, Jaden Reed. But nope, they don't have that pick. They gave that pick away, pick 32. You imagine having two first-round picks, one of them is number one overall, one of them is number 32 overall, and they came away with pick 10, Darnell Wright. 
I know they got some additional compensation, but that kind of sucks a little bit. Excuse me, they got pick 10 and uh, Chase Claypool. God, that's brutal. Good for the Steelers, though, who got their guy Joey Porter. But, you know, I, I wanted to play a clip. I've been wanting to for a while, but I, I just went and listened to a bunch of it. it it's, there's too big a gaps in between, like, these tiny little nuggets that kind of indicate something. But um, it was, uh, what is this guy's name? Demarcus Walker, who they brought in. He's talking about coming in and, and being a leader and teaching these guys how to work and all that stuff. And it, it just kind of gave me the impression that he realizes that a new culture needs to be built there and there isn't necessarily an established culture of, of a, a great work ethic. And again, you've got their running back in Montgomery leaving, saying the team just doesn't care, right? They're, they're not, they, they don't care about winning and that kind of stuff. And I want to go to a culture that appreciates winning is literally what he said. And so Demarcus Walker comes in and he's like, you know, I've learned from Von Miller and Aqib Tlaib, Super Bowl champions in Denver. I learned, you know, toughness and grit and hard work from Tennessee. And, you know, I'm just trying to push these guys to teach them that, implying that's not something that they have right now. So, yeah, you get reports about wide receivers that aren't really trying. And that's an individual thing. I'm sure there's guys here that are constantly working and guys that aren't. But I'm just saying there's there is a culture in a locker room. And each locker room is different. And I, I don't think that... um you know, Demarcus Walker's getting the impression that the Chicago Bears locker room is one that leaves him in awe of, you know, how amazing everybody. And, and again, he was in Denver and he was the guy that was sitting back learning. Chicago brought him in to be the teacher because there just isn't that, you know, there just isn't that ethic there. And I hope it stays that way. Anyways, final thing, then we'll take a break, come back, look at running back. Um, again, picking on the Bears a little bit. Shout out to uh, our anonymous poster in the Facebook group who found this. Um, this is uh, Parkins and Spiegel show. Uh, this at 670, the score in Chicago. Adam Hogue is the person calling in, reporting on what he's seen so far from Justin Fields. I'm, look, guys, today was not a great day for QB1. I don't so I'm hear wondering that. if may, maybe it was the visor. Maybe he had a different color visor on today, and I just didn't pay close enough attention and didn't know. I, I, I'll chase the actual story. Why wasn't it a good day for QB1? What happened, Adam? That's a good question. Really, like, yesterday wasn't great either. But today was, when he's throwing to DJ Moore, he looks like that quarterback that Matt Eberflus, Luke Getze, any one of us have said is the goal for this offseason, right? Get rid of the ball faster. Make faster decisions. Be more accurate. When he's throwing to DJ Moore, I see that quarterback. I mean, that's there, and I think that that's been relatively consistent. The concern for me, and I wasn't even really considering it too much of a concern until really the last two days, is just when he's going other places, I'm still seeing more of the guy we saw last year where there just is that inconsistency. And today especially, and it was just today. It really hasn't been these other practices. We've been able to watch five total over the last – five weeks or so now, four weeks. But I found myself standing there on the practice field today, literally saying, throw the ball, throw the ball. And I don't have a great answer for you on, on the timing thing, because especially when it comes to seven on seven, there, there's not even the fake pass rush without pads on. There is no pass rush. There literally is not anybody coming at you. And there's just been plays where I see him, with that little hitch, that little extra like hesitation before he unloads it. And then he, and then he will unload it to where he's looking. And like, there's one example today, I think it was to Tyler Scott, where he did that little extra hitch. He finally decides to throw it and it gets broken up by Jalen Johnson because you just can't give DBs at this level, that little half extra second to make the break on it, or they're going to make the play and, so, again, I'm mostly talking about today and a little bit from yesterday um, on that conversation, but it was a little bit concerning to me today. So I, I was thinking about this because it's always different when you're talking about the Packers, when you're talking about a rival, and when you're just talking about a, a team that you're indifferent about. Let me give you an example. I, I'm much more critical of the Packers in terms of, like, I'm, I'm legitimately worried about Jordan Love. I think there's plenty of signs that point to, you know, the rational part of my brain is saying there's plenty here that shows that he can be quite good. And even if he isn't great, he might become great in a year or two or whatever. When it comes to like Fields and Trubisky, I was always nervous. Like right now, I'm legitimately nervous that this is going to be the breakout year. It's year three. He was bad in year one. 
He got worse in year two, and the reports coming out so far is that he looks like the exact same quarterback. Let me give you a different quarterback and ask you a serious question. Zach Wilson, do we think he is going to become an elite quarterback? No, we don't. We saw him, and he was bad, and we said that's what he is. But when it comes to fields, he was bad, and we're like, all right, let's give him one more year. Then he was worse. All right, let's give him one more year. Did the exact same thing with Trubisky. Yeah, he was bad, but maybe he got better. Ah, maybe, 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 maybe. For most guys, and although this is not necessarily true and maybe not necessarily fair, necessarily being a key word here, we kind of look at it and say, okay, that's what you are. Maybe not necessarily as a rookie, but when we look at these quarterbacks that aren't panning out, you know, what? what uh, who's the guy in San Francisco? Trey Lance. I don't think he, he's never going to become a good quarterback. We've, I mean, it's it's done. Is his? Why do I think that? I don't know. He's just bad. But yet, for some reason, when I think about fee, I know it sounds surprising because I trash a guy all the time. But that's just what he did in the past. I'm just trying to convince you that he was bad because apparently that's debatable, even though it's not. Anyways, with an S. Why don't we go ahead and take a break? Please remember to check out my uh, pinned tweet, the GoFundMe. Very important uh, cause, very tragic situation. Um, trying to support some uh, fellow Packer fans in a very, very tragic situation. We, we're, we're just $30 away, by the way, from $5,000 right there. So it continues to go up. I think we've got another like 10 donors over the last 24, 48 hours, something like that, which is fantastic. Please, please, please jump in. Again, I, there's a lot of intimidating uh, donors in here with some big, big dollar amounts. I did not put in a massive dollar amount. Anything you can do, dollar, two dollars. Again, if everybody listening here just gave a buck, we'd be there. So please think about that. Also, if everybody listening gave a dollar to me, I would have a lot of dollars. So think about that also. Patreon.com forward slash Pack underscore Daddy if you'd like to support the podcast. Hit me up on Venmo, Pack and a Podcast. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you're here in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is not as uh, simple as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened up so many more doors. The show is called The The Deal. Deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price. Priceline. All righty, let's take a look at what we got going on over here with the Green Bay Packers running back room. Why do people that have radio stations talk like that? Like, would you go to radio school and they teach you to do that? I, I would just laugh hysterically if they're like, all right, here's how I'm going to get you to talk on the radio. Get you to talk like this. Then people will be so amazed by your voice they won't be able to stop listening. They'll be fascinated by how much you sound like an idiot. In a clown. A radio. It's dumb. Um, beep beep boop ba da beep boop. Nickelodeon. They still do that over there on Nickelodeon, or is that is that old school? Nick, 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 Nickelodeon. I don't know. Anyways, our running back room as of right now, Aaron Jones followed by A.J. Dillon. We have Patrick Taylor and Tyler Goodson still on the docket. Lou Nichols was our seventh round rookie pick. And we also brought in undrafted free agent Emmanuel Wilson. Again, as far as Jones and Dylan, it's not really necessary to dig into their college because I think they're established enough into the NFL that it's not really going to give us a whole lot of information. 
But Aaron Jones has been one of the premier running backs in the NFL, despite not necessarily being um, appreciated as such. I think everybody knows he's good. I don't think anybody really understands how good this guy is. When you look at his grades since 2017, uh, 79, 81, 85, 79, 83, and then this year was actually his best year at 86. He had a 90 rushing grade. He is consistently top 10, top 5, top 3 running back every single year he also has a 5.1 yard per uh, attempt average which is just freaking staggering his average this past year was 5.3 i remember when he came into the league i've told this several times but he ran for 5.5 yards on not a ton of attempts it was 81 yards 448 excuse me 81 attempts 448 yards four touchdowns 5.5 yards per attempt and a lot of the time when he got his yards he, he didn't really see anywhere to run, so he just kind of broke to the outside and got a big run, and I'm thinking, that's not really sustainable, and neither is 5.5 yards per attempt. The next year, 133 attempts, 728 yards, 5.5 yards per attempt, he did it again. Then it dipped down to 4.6, and it's like, okay, that's, you know, he cracked 1,000 yards for the first time, got a ton more carries, 4.6 yards per attempt, 16 touchdowns, that was his big touchdown year. And then he's right back at it, 5.5 yards per attempt in 2020. Then 2021, he dips back down to 4.7, then right back to 5.3, almost right at 5.5 again. He also had a career-high 1,125 yards uh, on the ground this past year. Only two touchdowns, though. Five fumbles was also significantly higher for him. Two was the highest previously, so a little bit of a struggle there. But, I mean, fantastic news to see that he basically peaked last year because although you can say, okay, he's 28, you you can expect him to start to go the other direction, it doesn't have to be a sharp decline. I I wouldn't expect him to be in the 60s unless there's just some major issue schematically with the offense in terms of teams keying off or whatever on on Aaron Jones or, you know, but him as a runner, I don't really see any reason to believe that he would regress. I I shouldn't say that, that he would regress massively. If he goes back, it's going to be you know, down from, again, a 90 rushing grade. I think the only real big issue here, because we don't need to worry about the 53-man roster, he's obviously going to make the 53-man roster and be our number one running back because he's just that good. The only question really is how long is he going to be around? I mean, 28 years old is not necessarily, hey, we got to dump this guy territory. We're getting close. I mean, once you get up to 30, then you kind of start to think those things. At 28, though, it's a touch early. And next year, obviously, it'll be 29. Although, when you look at his contract, I tend to think that next year, put a big circle around it, he may not be here. Although I said that two years ago, or, you know, I guess last year, and then I said it this year as well. I don't know if he's coming back. But in all reality, I mean, it's entirely possible that he is back next year. I mean, his his contract does spike up to 17.7. Obviously, same as, same as with David Bakhtiari. They're not paying the, the amount of money. I mean, even even this year, it was I forget what the number was, but it was something insane. It was it was a really high number for Aaron Jones, and obviously we didn't end up paying that. His cap hit this year is only eight million, which is extremely reasonable. Yes, he took a pay cut, but again, this is why assuming that we know what's going to happen can be fallacious because you never really know. Not only can they kind of tweak some of the numbers a little bit, or at the very least push some money out. Uh, occasionally, you might get a guy that's willing to take a pay cut, and so everything we thought we knew ended up being wrong. No, I'm not necessarily expecting him to do it again, although I think he's done it twice already. But again, $17.7 million is the cap hit for him next year. The dead cap, if we let him go, is 12, so it's not that big of a saving. So there's a, a decent chance that we end up bringing him back. Maybe they restructure his contract a little bit because that's 177 this year. After he is gone in 2025, let's just say there's no additional contracts, it's a $6 million dead cap hit with him being gone, which is, you know, it's it's higher than I'd like it to be, but I think there's enough wiggle room that you could kind of bring the 17 down and bring the 6 up. You know, 15 and 8 or something. I don't know. But Aaron Jones is here to stay. Clearly our top guy. Fantastic running back. Then we get A.J. Dillon, who, according to PFF at least, is probably our most underrated player on the entire team. A lot of people in Green Bay don't even really like A.J. Dillon. His grades over his three years... And by the way, rookies, if you can get a rookie that has like a 70 PFF grade, that's a great year. His rookie year, he had an 81 grade and an 85 rushing grade. In 2021, that went up to 86. His rushing grade was a 90, which is almost identical to Aaron Jones' highest ever this past year. And then in 2022, he had an 81.4 grade again, exact same as what he had his rookie year, but his rushing grade was an 88.1. He was graded as a top five running back, probably has been pretty much every year 
that he's been in Green Bay. Now, that hasn't materialized into as much as we would have liked. Obviously, as a rookie, he played very little. He was actually pretty impressive. That Tennessee game was fantastic. But in 2021, he had 803 yards, 4.3 yards per attempt, five touchdowns, two fumbles. In uh, 2022, he had 769 yards, 4.2 yards per attempt, seven touchdowns, and one fumble. And so there may be some level of disappointment. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty big number. There's no doubt about it. He doesn't have a lot of the big breakaways like Aaron Jones does. But when you're, you know, 4.3 yards per attempt is pretty solid. He also faces much more stacked boxes. If you go over to Next Gen Stats, eight or more defenders in the box. Aaron Jones saw that 10.8% of the time, A.J. Dillon 16.13. So it's not exactly apples to apples to look at the two of them and say A.J. Dillon doesn't belong in the same uh, conversation as Aaron Jones. There does seem to be some rumblings about A.J. Dillon and whether or not he's actually going to end up sticking around because, again, a lot of people just don't generally like him, so why would you pay the guy? Um, I think they're going to pay him. Aaron Jones is going to be out the door. A.J. Dillon is... A, a trained Green Bay Packer. He runs the ball well. He's a good receiver. He's a good blocker. He gives them that size, power element. And so, yeah, he is in the final year of his contract. I expect him to get paid again and probably relatively soon. Um, could be wrong, but I, I don't see a reason to let him go. Even if you're saying, you know, you could replace him in the draft. Well, we're going to have to replace him and Aaron Jones. There's no reason to do that. You pay A.J. Dillon. You, when knowing Aaron Jones is going to walk out the door, and then we're going to have to find help in addition to A.J. Dillon. Now, if you find somebody better than him, congratulations, but you don't let both of them walk out the door and then have no running backs, and um, and no, you don't let him walk out the door because you're keeping Aaron Jones because you can't keep him forever. He's going to be gone, and if you try to keep him forever, the wheels are going to fall. I mean, he's, he's, he's going into being 29 years old this year. He's 28 and a half right now. So next year he will turn 30. Keeping Aaron Jones isn't an option, just like keeping Aaron Rodgers wasn't an option. That was for more than one reason, but at some point, age is a factor, and it's just it's an inevitable, inevitable thing. So, hoping for a big year from Dylan. We'll see how it goes. He is locked in very clearly, very easily as the Packers' number two running back. And after that, it gets to be a little bit iffy. The two guys that we're familiar with are Tyler Goodson and Patrick Taylor. Patrick Taylor is the one that we're going to be a little bit, a little bit more familiar with. He got picked up as an undrafted free agent in 2020 with the Green Bay Packers. He's put in a little bit of work, including the regular season. In 2021, actually, he had an 80 overall grade. It was only 23 attempts, but 23 attempts, 89 yards, 3.9 yards per attempt, and a touchdown. He had 3.04 yards per attempt after contact, 12, or excuse me, six missed tackles forced. He did a pretty good job. Then we saw him again in 2020. He came into spell once in a while. Came in in the in the Jets game, didn't really get an opportunity to do much. Week 13 against Chicago, he came in. He had three snaps, one attempt. It was six yards. In week 15, uh, four attempts for 15 yards. Then week 16 against Miami, he was in there. Again, four snaps, but never touched the ball. And then week 17 against Minnesota, five snaps, 10 yards, two yards per attempt. And that was really the only game where he was graded out kind of poorly. So he's six foot three. He's 223 pounds. He is a big running back. 25 years old. He's plenty young. And if we dig back a little bit into his college years, um, wasn't necessarily an elite player. He didn't, you know, he's not cracking a thousand yards. His PFF grades were right in the 70s, 68, 70, 76, 69. He had 500, 700, 800. And then in 2019, he had 250 yards. Um, in the 40 yard dash, he ran a 457, which, you know, is not blazing fast, but it's fine. Cons- I mean, it's. Uh, He's a 55th percentile, the 457, but at his size, 6'3", 223, it's actually 70th percentile. His broad jump was also really impressive. If we go back, uh, actually, Dane Brugler had a 2020 draft guide, and Mr. Patrick Taylor is in it. By the way, they have him listed at 6'3", but he actually measured in at about 6'1 so that's a major discrepancy there. I don't know why PFF has him listed at 6'3". Anyways, he's a big dude. Here's what he had to say about him. Three-star recruit out of high school. Committed to Memphis over Colorado. His role increased each of his first three seasons. He shared a backfield with Daryl Henderson and Tony Pollard, so two pretty well-known and established guys, which is part of the reason the numbers were low. And actually, if you look at it, his yards per attempt were very high in the first three seasons anyways, 5.7, 5.8, and 5.5. So you give him a bunch more carries, and he's going to have a billion yards. But it was a a shared backfield. Uh, He was tops on the depth chart as a senior, but he injured his foot soon after the opener. He missed most of the 2019 season. 
Big physical runner with quick controlled steps to avoid the trash. Doesn't consistently run behind his pads. Requires a mo momentum. Reset his eyes. And the lane isn't defined. While consistently productive in college, his numbers were inflated by scheme, and he often wasn't touched within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. Overall, Taylor has projectable size, speed, and ball skills, but his vision runs hot, cold, and he plays too upright as a runner and blocker. So he's A.J. Dillon light. Here is my concern for Patrick Taylor. My thought generally on these things is the older guys are the ones that get recycled. Unless they really, really like you and, and, and see you definitively as that dude. Because eventually, you know, we, we bring you in as a long shot. We try to develop you to see if you can reach that ceiling, that high potential. And if you're just not getting there, we're going to give that shot to somebody else. And we've got, you know, Tyler Goodson was a undrafted free agent just last year. Lou Nichols is a seventh round pick this year. So again, unless Patrick Taylor can be a guy that is just heads and tails above Goodson, Nichols, etc., Emmanuel Wilson, I would say his head is first on the chopping block. Because again, it is just a constant rotation. As soon as you get picked up as an undrafted free agent, you're on a conveyor belt. You get put at the back of the conveyor belt. As the conveyor belt moves forward, you either get plucked off the conveyor belt and say, yes, you are a core guy, you get to stay, or eventually you fall off and we just continue this conveyor belt, which has behind Patrick Taylor, Tyler Goodson, and then behind him is Lou Nichols and Emmanuel Wilson, just based on when they were drafted. So that brings us to Tyler Goodson. So Tyler Goodson, as I said, was just brought in last year as an undrafted free agent. Very different than Patrick Taylor. Five foot nine, 197 pounds. Comes out of the Big Ten, playing for the Iowa Hawkeyes. Grades are pretty similar, as are the statistics. 5.1, 5.4, and 4.6 yards per attempt. His grades 74, 75, 70. Ran for 600, 700, and then almost 1,100 yards in 2019, uh, 2020, and 2021. Dane Brugler had him as his number 31 running back out of 40. Reading a little bit into him, he came out of the same... Um, High school as tight end Jared, uh, Jared Cook and offensive tackle Juwan James. He was a senior captain of the high school football team and was named Georgia Player of the Year and earned all county and all state honors. Also lettered in basketball, baseball, and track. He was a three star recruit, passed up places like Clemson and Michigan to go to the Hawkeyes. And then if we just get to the overall portion, we'll skip all the other stuff. It says, overall, Goodson has NFL quality, lateral quickness, and pass catching skills, but his average explosiveness and run toughness will limit his touches at the next level. His best path to an NFL roster spot will be to find a team that values his receiving ability. So again, exact opposite. You've got the bigger, heavier guy, your A.J. Dillon type, and then you've got your Aaron Jones type and Tyler Goodson. Now, Let's go back last year and compare what these two did in the preseason. Not just in terms of quality, but in terms of how many opportunities that each of these guys was given. So, in the preseason, Tyler Goodson was the top guy. He, Patrick Taylor, Dexter Williams all played in three games, so all three. And the rookie Tyler Goodson had the most carries, 37 snaps compared to Patrick Taylor's 21. He had 28 attempts compared to Taylor's 18. 107 yards compared to 71. They were very close in terms of 3.8 yards compared to 3.9 yards per attempt. But Tyler Goodson had one touchdown. He was the only running back to get a touchdown in the preseason. If you look at the grades in the preseason, the rushing grades were very similar. 66.8 for Tyler Goodson, 66.2 for Patrick Taylor. However, what did we hear about Tyler Goodson? He's a receiver. Patrick Taylor is not. That made a major difference. Tyler Goodson had a 75 receiving grade. Patrick Taylor had a 30 receiving grade. So overall, Tyler Goodson was the number one running back with a 68 grade. Patrick Taylor was a 56. Based on one, you know, again, rushing ability, they were dead even. But receiving, Tyler Goodson was very good. Patrick Taylor was very bad. However, worth noting, Patrick Taylor had an 84 pass blocking grade. Tyler Goodson had a 28 pass blocking grade. So very equal runners. Tyler Goodson's a good receiver, but a bad blocker. Patrick Taylor's a good blocker, but a bad receiver. So, <laughs> very, very much polar opposites. As you would expect, Patrick Taylor had more yards after contact. Tyler Goodson made more people miss. He's more shifty. The longest run came from, as you would expect, Tyler Goodson, 24 yards. Patrick Taylor, just 11. So, that'll be the interesting thing to watch. And, I I importantly, first of all, does do either of these guys separate as runners, Tyler Goodson or Patrick Taylor? Secondly, you're looking at Patrick Taylor's receiving ability. That's going to be major for him, for him to not get booted 
off the team is is for him to pick up his receiving ability. And for Tyler Goodson, you want to see him blocking. That brings us to Mr. Lou Nichols. Lou Nichols is the rookie this year, seventh round pick, pick 237. Like a lot of our picks, if you go to 2022, that's not when you're going to see the best of Lou Nichols. Uh, he had a significantly reduced role and also a significantly reduced performance as he was battling injuries. I don't exactly remember what those were. I just know that he was dealing with injuries throughout the year. He did miss a series of games in there, but um, 2021 was his big year and, and probably the best grade of all the guys that we've listed. That was the best year. Now, granted, this is Central Michigan Chippewas, so we're just, you know we're not talking about the best competition. But 311 attempts, 1,707 yards, 5.5 yards per attempt, 15 touchdowns, and one fumble. The year before that, actually had 6.4 yards per attempt. He is uh, 21, going on 22 this year, and he's five foot 11, 222. So kind of a blend of the two, a little bit of a smaller banger. Wasn't invited to the combine. He did go to his pro day. Didn't do any 40 time, any of that kind of stuff, but did have a 37 inch uh, vert, 22 reps on the bench. And then going back over his overall here, it says overall Nichols is a productive, determined runner with solid feel between the tackles, but his next level potential will be capped by a lack of creativity with the ball in his hands and inconsistent passing down skills. His workhorse approach could get him on the field in the right situation. He is a really fun guy to watch. One of the things that's also mentioned here talks about his blend of quickness and power. Nichols could be a tackle breaker and won't need gaping holes to reach the second level. And you can see that, right? So so maybe he doesn't have the creativity like Aaron Jones to be able to find that escape when it's not necessarily there. But this guy has got a, a, a unique blend of speed and power. That's just fun to watch. Um, as far as the 53, I don't think there's really too much doubt unless he's just a massive disappointment. He's a project that they picked up. They're going to put some time and effort into him and see what they can get out of him. So I think Lou Nichols is more or less a lock on this team. Tyler Goodson, I would assume, is also going to probably stay on the team as well. Again, that makes me wonder about Patrick Taylor. Now, to be fair, I'm not saying they necessarily make the 53. It, it could be practice squad, but I, I don't know that Patrick Taylor goes down to the practice squad, if, if, if he's even eligible anymore. I think he is because he barely played anything. But the, the question is, who's going to be that guy to back up A.J. Dillon and Aaron Jones. And if they genuinely think Patrick Taylor's that guy, then guess what? He's that guy and he's going to stay there. And then maybe it's Tyler Goodson is, you know, with Lou Nichols in the practice squad. I I don't know. Depends how many guys they want to hang on to. Do you want two guys taking up practice squad spots? But again, in my estimation, Patrick Taylor's the guy with the most to lose on on this team. He's the one that has to prove that he shouldn't just be the next guy to get booted off the team that there is more to him and that he is necessary and that he is the next best running back and he has proven he can do X, Y, and Z, not just running the ball at a mediocre rate and being a decent blocker, but I I, I can run better and I'm a a much better receiver. And then finally, a guy that we have not talked about yet, um, another big running back. I'm telling you, Goody loves these big running backs, man. Six foot one, 220 pounds. If there's anything that makes me think Tyler Goodson's leaping, it's the fact that he's like 200 pounds. But I can't even find any data on him via PFF because he went to Fort Valley State Wildcats. He initially got picked up by the Denver Broncos. They apparently released him and the Packers picked him up and that's how he ended up here. Even the Beast guy doesn't have anything on him other than some basic information. You know, best of the rest. He has him ranked 48th out of, uh, let's see, well, we've got 138 different running backs. So actually, as far as best of the rest goes, he's one of the top guys. He's got 34 running backs that are ranked, and he's at 48. But anyways, uh, Fort State Valley, 4-5-5-40 time, which again is really not that bad considering he's 220 pounds. 7-2-3-3 cone is not fantastic. 4-3-9 short shuttle, 34.5 inch vert, 10 foot broad jump. So these are not terrible measurables. Really long arms, big wingspan, almost 80 inch wingspan for whatever that's worth. Some other people that did do a little bit of scouting on him, this is via uh, Lance Zerline. Size and burst are NFL caliber and worth keeping an eye on if he makes it into a camp as a priority free agent. Productive Division II running back. Possesses the build, scored 14 touchdowns on his final five college games. He's got plus acceleration through the line of scrimmage. Scrimmage shows off agility for backside cuts, capable pass catcher. Weaknesses would like to see more physicality. Run style can be too upright, pass protection, lacks knee bend, blah, blah, blah. 
And last one, here's what Tony Pauline had to say about him. Large, powerful ball carrier who was super productive at the college level, runs with proper lean and gains his foot, uh, keeps his foot feet moving, picks up a lot of yardage, yardage off initial contact and moves the pile, rarely brought down by a single defender, doesn't go down without a fight and falls forward when tackled, possesses solid short area quickness, has a burst of speed and runs with authority. Patient finds a hole and squeezes through the small openings of the offensive line. Shifty and shows the ability to bounce around defenders or piles. Makes defenders miss in the open field. Easily gets back to running balance off the initial hit. Devastating blocker who shows excellent vision and pass protection. Sells out to stop the blitz. Stones defenders to stop them in their tracks and works blocks. Easily adjusts to the press and reaches back for the reception. Weaknesses cannot run to daylight. Not a truly creative ball carrier and struggles when he tries to make multiple moves. He has small hands. Okay. Overall, Wilson is a brute on a small school level and a featured runner able to handle a lot of carries. He has enough ability to make an NFL roster as a fifth running back used in short yardage or goal line situations. So there you go. Another big bruiser in Emmanuel Wilson. And of course, this is probably the biggest long shot. I would probably bet the least on Emmanuel Wilson, but we'll have to see. Again, once training camp comes around, it's good to not only get to know these guys, but to kind of know what you're looking for in them, right? We know Emmanuel Wilson's a long shot. Let's see if we start hearing some stuff. It's going to be tough for the bangers, right? Because there's not a lot of banging going on in training camp. Excuse me for that phrasing, but you get what I'm saying. There's not a lot of smashing into people, right? You got to be a little bit more delicate. So it's hard to feature, hey, put me in front of a pile of guys and watch me blast right through them. Well, no, we're not going to run that drill. You know, can can you uh, pass block? Yes. Can you r- catch? Can you show your vision and all that? And that's going to work against Emmanuel Wilson. So, anyways, this stuff just gets me excited for training camp, man. I want I want to see what they're doing now. I also need to put some flashcards together or something. I actually paid. I think it was like a one time payment. And it was a lot of money. I got to go find it. It was like these really cool flashcards that you can build. I got to go find it and log in because I already paid for it and start putting together some Packers flashcards and just have a ton of information on it and see how much I can memorize. Not a terrible idea. Sounds like fun. Let you know if I can find it. We can play together. Anyways, you guys have a good day. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.